Hey there, good people in crypto land. I'm Matt Lysing. This is my podcast, Decent People. Welcome back to the conversation. Today, I have on the show the head of cyber threat intelligence at Chainalysis. Her name is Jacqueline Burns Coven. And we had a great conversation, a very wide ranging conversation. We spoke about her time as an intelligence officer with the Department of Defense when she was stationed in the Middle East from about 2009 to 2015. Uh, we talked about what she is doing at Chainalysis, um, where she's basically uh, in charge of the team that will track uh, ransomware, um, they'll track scammers, and they'll try to use the blockchain um, to pinpoint addresses where bad actors are uh, ultimately depositing their funds that they've either stolen or scammed. So it's a really fascinating development in, in blockchain because unlike a bag of cash that might be handed over in a criminal enterprise or if you're getting extorted or somebody's taken for ransom in an extreme example, you can't trace that bag of cash. But with the blockchain, there's always a record and the forensics tools that firms like Chainalysis are using just keep getting more and more sophisticated. So we talked about that. We talked about Tornado Cash and some thoughts that Jackie had about that. And we talked about her, I joked with her that she used to work at a place called Enigma Technologies, which just to me really, come on, that sounds like a front, doesn't it? So all of that and more coming up in the conversation. As always, thanks for listening and really appreciate your support and hope you enjoy the conversation. Thanks. Hey, Jackie, how are you? Hi, Matt. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm great. Thanks. I've really been looking forward to speaking with you. You are the third amazing woman that we've had on the podcast here from Chainalysis. I had Aaron Plant on, who's in your area of the firm, in the cybercrime area. Aaron was fascinating. I still think she's like a CIA plant, but I'm not going to say that to too many people. <laughs> and spoke to Kim Grauer as well from Chainalysis, your head of research, who um, is always doing amazing work. I'm really happy to have you on. And it's not like third time's the charm. Everybody's been great, but I really love what you guys are doing at Chainalysis. So thanks for being here. No, thanks for having me. And you, Kim and, and Aaron are amazing. I feel very lucky to be working with them. Yeah, for sure. So to start with, I thought we're recording on Friday the 13th. So hopefully you're not trichodecophobic. But the big thing that's going on in crypto right now is the FTX trial. And I know that's not quite your area. But I was just curious, as someone who's in crypto, as I am, have you been keeping tabs on the trial and what's coming out there in terms of the background on, on how FTX imploded? Sure, definitely keeping track. I, I'm we watching uh, with the rest of the world. I, I'm not involved in in that case and can't really comment on it. But it certainly we see all of the the macroeconomic activities and events are impacting um, every facet of crypto. So certainly trying to to keep tabs on this as, as it will certainly have ripple effects. Yeah, for sure. It's just really blown my mind coming from the traditional financial world before this when I was at Bloomberg covering Wall Street, just seeing how brazen they were in terms of allegedly stealing customer money for all sorts of purposes. They didn't even give it a couple of years to then, and then start doing this. They just like right off the bat were <laughs> taking money from them, from folks. I just have found that incredible that I guess there's just nobody and there was no adult in the room there to tell them, hey, that's completely illegal. But the other thing I thought of when, when I was thinking about speaking to you is guest after guest on this podcast has brought up the point that a lot of those failures in 2022 were all centralized. It was FTX, there was Celsius, Block 5, Voyager, the list is long. And they were all centralized and there was no transparency into what they were doing and they could get away with kind of some shenanigans. Whereas what you're doing is it's all on chain and you're using forensics and you're using the public aspect of the blockchain database to to track people who are doing nefarious stuff. Do you feel that's, did we make a turning point, do you think, last year in terms of people understanding that the risks of centralized applications still in the DeFi world? It is unfortunate that those were some of the larger headlines related to crypto in the last year. But I, from my perspective, as a person who just focuses 100% on crypto badness, I need those 
those exchanges and those DeFi services, those compliance teams. There are good people there and the good guys in the ecosystem have done so much to combat illicit financing from thefts, from ransomware, from scams. And so it, I think for me, it's important to be able to highlight the, the good work that's being done by the crime fighters of the world that aren't necessarily gaining headlines, but they're continuing to do their jobs day in, day out, despite the kind of the cloud that has loomed over the space with this detrial. Yeah, for sure. It's interesting how FTX was making an effort to become a U.S. operation or they had a U.S. operation, but things didn't quite work out there. Are you optimistic about you need those, I guess you need the coin bases of the world, the Gemini's of the world, right? To, like you say, have their compliance teams and, and be partners in this. How do you feel about the regulatory environment right now in the U.S. in, in, in relation to those centralized exchanges that are trying to do the right thing and trying to play by the rules when they would probably say, that we don't really know what the rules are right now. Yeah, I'm not really best placed to comment on that. I'm more focused on regulations as they pertain to reporting illicit activity. And so I think those are some of the regulations that I'm looking at and following. And I think overall, there's been such a push in my space from the regulatory and law enforcement perspective to be able to shine a spotlight on illicit actors globally, illicit exchanges that are laundering dirty money, I've seen the sanctions designations of mixers, darknet markets, and exchanges yeah. based in, in Russia that have really made an impact on imposing cost and sending a message that those that would skirt the rules, even if they are beyond U.S. borders, can be impacted. And the U.S. isn't alone in this. We're actually seeing global regulators coming to bat, South Korea and the UK, for instance. I think there's a, a steady and also unpredictable cadence of regulations and sanctions designations that are really sending a strong signal and taking threat actors that may be laundering or processing dirty money by surprise, which is, I think, a very positive thing for the, the Yeah, users. that's great to hear. And that leads to, I was going to ask, what are, since crypto is such a global market and industry, you must be dealing with, like you said, governments and exchanges all around the world. What Are there certain areas of the world that, that are easier to work with now? Or is, is everybody coming along on the same page? Or how would you characterize the different parts of the world where crypto is, is active in terms of helping you guys when you have an investigation or maybe in flagging things to folks? Like, how, how is that, how's that looking these days? I think we're leagues better than we were when I was began in this industry about five years ago. I think there's always room for capacity building. I think FATF always, the Financial Action Task Force, always releases very descriptive guidelines for identifying potentially suspicious activity. Is that a global organization? It is, it okay. is. And, but there are certainly jurisdictions and we, we frequently point them out or that there are outliers in our crypto crime report, which basically summarizes illicit activity across the spectrum of, of crimes that may occur. But we see the same culprits geographically often that are, are receiving illicit funds. However, it's a smaller consolidated list of services than we saw several years ago, for instance. I think we're still seeing some of the same offenders, but a, a, a definitely a smaller list. And I think that is in large part due to, to law enforcement and regulatory actions that are able to shine a spotlight on these services that, that would be processing illicit funds. Okay. What, maybe right here at the top, we could, maybe you could give us like listeners an example of what you are investigating. Like maybe what's the most common illicit activities like ransomware or hacking or whatever. And then just maybe take us through the steps in a very high level process of what the, what, how the crime is committed and then where you guys come in and how you try to try to track down who committed the crime. Sure. So I lead our cyber threat intelligence team. So my team is looking at identifying wallets belonging to those that would 
scam, steal, and extort for cryptocurrency, as well as the tools and services they rely on for their attacks. And that can also include the goods and services that are illicit that can be purchased with cryptocurrency. So for example, child sexual abuse material, opioids, stolen credit card information. So we focus on dark net markets, fraud shops, stolen funds, scams, ransomware, malware. So it is just all of the possible spectrum of badness really is what my team focuses on. And certainly related to cyber threat intel, ransomware is has loomed large over the last few years. And not just in terms of the volume of attacks or the volume of proceeds they've been able to extort, but in terms of it being elevated to a a national security issue. And so for that reason, uh, ransomware is incredibly interesting to me because we're not just looking at the ransom payment address, that that wallet that receives the ransom payment. We're all looking we, from that one wallet, we can look back at all the tools and services, the entire network of actors that are comprised that organization that actually was a part of that campaign. So we know- I think it was, I, I was talking to Kim maybe about this, that you guys wrote about ransomware as a service. Like that's a new development, right? Where their folks are like farming this out. Yeah, it's it, incredibly isn't easy. Isn't that amazing? To become a part <laughs> of it now. You, it, with very little technical skill, you can buy commercial malware, phishing kits to conduct a number of crimes with a minimal deposit. Really, the bar has certainly, the barrier to entry is certainly low for many of the cyber crimes that we look at. Stealers is one, another one. So drainers that are targeting people's wallets and NFTs. We've seen many high profile cases recently of celebrities and other entrepreneurs. Wasn't it Kevin Rose just recently? Oh, yeah. uh, He got hit. He's been in crypto as long as anybody almost. So even sophisticated investors are subject to these types of things and the tools to commit these acts are relatively inexpensive. Yeah. You mentioned ransomware specifically. So that's when bad guys will infiltrate a computer system and maybe it's like a corporation or a hospital and they'll basically say, hey, you're not going to get your data back or your systems back unless you pay us X amount of crypto to this wallet. But then... It sounds like you were saying that it's elevating into national security concerns. Is is that because the ransomware attackers are now not just going to corporations or private enterprises, but they're going to government agencies or things like that? Yeah, we've seen several high profile statements from uh, the administration and law enforcement that have likened ransomware to to terrorism even. And the I think just the... I would say the the height of it, but really the lows of it, targeting hospitals amid the COVID-19 pandemic. We're seeing critical infrastructure like Colonial Pipeline, schools, municipalities, the defense industrial complex, all of those things have and continue to be hit. And while we did see a lull in ransomware activity last year, a 40% decline in ransom payments, This year is very different. This year is on track to be one of, if not the worst years in terms of ransomware revenue. So they're back in full force, unfortunately. And yeah, really nothing's off the table for them. We're seeing supply chain attacks that enable ransomware gangs to rack up hundreds, even thousands of victims from a single exploit. And they're getting hundreds of millions of dollars for just one group. And unfortunately, wow. it's a competitive ecosystem where they like to copycat each other. And I am afraid that we will likely see more of these. The use of zero days in ransomware now, it, that is at a level we've never seen before. What was that? It's a vulnerability in software that has never previously never been disclosed and until the attack event. Uh, Okay. Is that because ransomware is like these 
firms or any of the entities getting attacked, it, it seems like it's low hanging fruit. Is, is that what's, why there's so much of it and why it's on the rise? Because if you're, if you have a large operation, like a corporation where you've got maybe hundreds or thousands of people who need to be vigilant about their security and one of them gets fished or they, their credentials get stolen and then the ransomware folks are inside. Is, is that the vulnerability that, that you guys see? And, and that's like why this is hard to combat? It's very hard to combat. So even the most sophisticated organizations who spend a large percentage of, of budget on cybersecurity, it, everyone is fallible. Nothing is off the table. Unfortunately, we're in the stage of big game hunting. So where threat actors are able to be choosy, find targets that are able to shell out large payouts that have insurance policies that will cover eight-figure ransoms at times. But we're seeing b both. We're seeing this big game hunting dynamic where sophisticated actors can deploy really sophisticated attacks, phishing, vulnerabilities, zero days, which are not cheap. And we're also seeing the less sophisticated actors going after the low-hanging fruit. And we think, and we're seeing this play out in average ransom demands. We're seeing like eight figure ransoms and we're still seeing like three, four figure ransoms too. And we think that there's been a large you know, public effort to make people aware of ransomware, enforce best practices. Certainly insurance policies have gotten more stringent in requiring those that they cover to have MFA, to have endpoint detection, to have training, to have a plan if and when they're hit by ransomware, to have backups so that maybe they need not pay if they are hit. We think it has become more challenging to, to target certain entities by ransomware actors. So that might be pushing one that are a little bit desperate for cash or not as technically sophisticated towards the lower hanging fruit. But we're certainly seeing large public and private sector entities that might be surprising on a data leak sites. So these ransomware actors will basically name and shame victims on their site. So it um, becomes public knowledge. And so it kind of ratchets up the pressure for them to pay the extortion demand. Yeah. I think it's also an important point to make that as you guys have reported, the amount of illicit activity that's like crypto is used for is shockingly small. I don't know. If, I think this might still be current, but it was something like 0.1% of all crypto activity is illicit. And so that it's a lot of people, I think, I think crypto has a bad reputation and a lot of people think it's just all scams, but the numbers don't bear that out at all. With that in mind, I was, I wanted to ask if you guys have ever done an analysis, maybe we could um, coin a few new terms here, like crypto crime, like decrime, like de decentralized crime versus traditional crime, like trad crime, <laughs> trad crime. Do, have you, do you, have you ever looked at what is the number, what's the amount of, of money that's laundered and extorted in the real world that's not digital versus what we're seeing in the digital world? Is that anything you guys have ever tried to put a comparison on? That's really interesting. You know, and I'm glad you bring that that point. Consistently, our calculations always come up with crypto, cyber crime, crypto crime being a fraction of a percentage compared to overall crypto activity. And to answer your question, I don't think we can, we can quantify the dollars in traditional financial crime because there, there's no way to trace it. And that's a, a point of, like, we tried to make consistently is that it, this, the traceability of cryptocurrency is its Achilles heel for bad actors. It is very hard to launder and get away with. It can be quantified. And yes, it is a fraction of a percentage overall that is uh, related to crime, but that fraction of percentage is 100% of my job. And being able to see all of that is a lot. So to, <laughs> uh, I just want my boss to hear that. It's a lot. No, but the fact that you can see <laughs> all of it is fascinating. And for a nosy person like me that likes to understand the ins and outs of all of these different crime typologies, it is there's nothing, no better lens to look at it. And I love it because 
it is often that missing puzzle piece when other indicators, other visibility and telemetry can only get you halfway there on the who done it attribution or where did it go or who else is involved? How did they get in? How did they break into the house? Uh, meaning like an institution that they hacked into and often looking at their shopping cart, looking at all those, the infrastructure and tools and services and commodity malware encrypting services that they purchase can tell the full picture just by looking at the receipts, so to speak. Yeah. So depending on what they're using or where they get it from, you might, that might paint a picture for you about where this, where these people are located and that, this, that sort of thing, just give you more clues uh, as you go about your investigation. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you really, you run yeah, into a wall very quickly in the traditional financial ecosystem. And I love to, I love, so I, I work with a lot of financial institutions and many who are very sophisticated in this space already, but I love speaking with newcomers because I, that moment when the light bulb comes on for them, that they're, they're like untethered they They can actually see so much more than they can in the traditional, than the traditional financial system that they were brought up in. Yeah. You get to, you get to blow their minds a little bit. <laughs> um, it, hearing you talk, it, it made me wonder if I think a lot of times people like, I feel like cops, if you're a cop, you're always dealing with criminals or people who are in bad situations. That's what you're doing here in crypto. But are you able to separate like that from the bigger picture in crypto? Or I know you see a lot of the bad stuff, but are you taking in the good stuff as well? That's a really interesting question. And because we can see so much, sometimes it feels like the work never stops. So it's a, a blessing and a curse. So I think it's really important like for like mental health and cyber and investigations and law enforcement, I think is all so super important. Burnout is a super important topic. So celebrating the wins, I think is really important. And I w I'm so fortunate to work with people who are just smart, but also have a sense of humor and we can make light of situations and know when to take a break and have a beer. Yeah, certainly there's a lot to celebrate, even though a lot of what we do is really serious. And there, thankfully, seizures of assets, identification of the perpetrator, successful court cases that are all the wins that kind of buoy us, even in the darker times. Yeah. So prior to chain analysis, you were an intelligence officer with the Department of Defense. What, did that, what can you tell me about what you were doing there and, and how did that prepare you for what you're doing now in the, in the Web3 space? Yeah, that's actually a, a perfect segue from our, your last question because I was doing pretty serious work in the Department of Defense. I loved it. I was an intern in college and went on to work full time. So I had never had any exposure to, to private sector prior to joining the government. And I was deployed to the Middle East. I was definitely a beneficiary of the, the post 9-11 age, which was um, all about, you know, destroying the silos that had caused intelligence failures with 9-11. And so I was working with interagency. I feel like I rode every ride at the amusement park. I was just loving it, raising my hand to, to do all the assignments, doing things I had no business doing in my 20s. Like sometimes I'd have to pinch myself. I felt like for a scump sometimes. I can't believe I'm doing this. Like, how did I get in this room? And it was a wonderful experience and worked with incredible people. But honestly, had never, blockchain and cryptocurrency had never entered my vocabulary at the time when I was in government. I'm sh sure, most certain that has changed since then. So just to set the stage, this is like from, yeah, so you were with the DOD from roughly... 2008 to about 2015. That's correct. That's correct. And I decided to go to grad school, get my master's, thinking that that would set me up for management when I would return back to government. Uh, I had no intention of leaving government, really. 
And that was my first kind of foray outside of the black box of classifications and compartmentalization. And Mm -hmm. I had access to, for the first time in my life, to things like social media and data science and blockchain. And 2015, as you mentioned, in New York, where I went to grad school, was it felt like such uh, like a renaissance to me. And it was during this time where startups were the thing and being more like a startup and disruption. And I was so taken by that message after being in government for so long about how fast and how innovative startups could be and in all these new technologies that I had no exposure to in government. It wasn't exactly Mm, like Jason Bourne with like touch screens and holograms and things like that. And that's when I first came in touch in contact with blockchain. And it was really the blockchain that I fell in love with first before cryptocurrency came later. I loved learning about this novel technology. I loved how it incorporated politics and economics and philosophy and engineering and math. And it was just such a, so many smart, interesting people building things, which I think was such a needed optimism that after several years working on dark, serious stuff in in government, it was just so refreshing to to enter this ecosystem in 2015. Yeah, I agree with you. I I think obviously crypto is a huge industry. Back then it was a lot smaller, but I've always been very impressed with that. There was a good chunk of of this industry that that are are full of good people and they're literally trying to make the world a better place and they think they can do it. And that's what motivates them. And that was something that was refreshing to me after having covered Wall Street for a long time. A lot of the motivation there is money and that's about it. And you know, the financial crisis was something I went through firsthand and saw that to devastating effect. Getting after that, like transitioning into covering blockchain and what the Web3 kind of space has become was great because there are a lot of people in that, in that world who, like you said, are optimistic and they think they're not trying to replace anything, but they're trying to pre- provide an alternative for folks that I find really admirable. Can you talk about anything like what you're doing in the Middle East for the DOD? Was, were you like in, in trying to disrupt communications networks or anything like that, that, that I'm just fascinated by that kind of work? I'll say that I ended my tenure being a nuclear weapons analyst and thought I was taking a hard oh, right to join a, a blockchain <laughs> startup. But sometimes I feel like I'm just a nuclear weapons program accountant some days when we're tracking North Korean stolen funds. but. I know I've had a. Um, it does come full circle with the Lazarus Group, doesn't it? Doesn't it? <laughs> uh, I wanted to get to the Lazarus Group, but look, first of all, I'd, I'd love to just take another step back. You mentioned how blockchain and what fascinated you. Partly, it was it incorporated economics and politics and economics and all these other disciplines. When you were growing up as a girl. Was that, were you a jack of all trades? Was that like, were you interested in all those sorts of things and how they intersect? Or how would you characterize like why though that sort of broad spectrum appealed to you so much? Yeah, I am actually an army brat. So I moved probably 13 times before I went to college. And so we would just airdrop in to a new location, a new school, a new country, a new language, and just have to make do like, this is your home for the next year or the next two years. And just being having to get up to speed quickly on your new environment and make friends. And I actually, I love that lifestyle. I know it's not for everyone, but I think that really started my desire to new, learn new languages, which kind of, and I also would get bored if we lived somewhere too long. Oh, it's been two years. We should probably move. And I, in this space, you could never be bored. i am it's constantly humbling. It just moves so much faster than any other intelligent subject I've ever been a part of. And I think that's why I see myself in this space for the rest of my career is just, it's 
constantly innovating in in ways that that benefit people and and build businesses, but also at my job, watching how threat actors are adapting to. So I think my upbringing in moving around has certainly influenced me. My my parents being in the military certainly gave me like a sense of mission and service. Although I was the black sheep in the family and I went, I was a civilian in the Department of Defense and didn't join the military and I'll I'll never live that down. But I'm hoping they understand now (laughs) what I'm doing. I think it was a little bit uneasy for them um, to, to try to describe what a startup was. If you can describe blockchain forensics to your parents, then you're a couple steps ahead of me because uh, I'm still struggling with that. Thanks. Um, yeah. Any uh, tips? <laughs> I was cur- yeah. I was curious, um, as an army brat, you mentioned you have to become really good at making friends quickly and, and adapting to new environments. How do you think that affected your ability to maintain relationships through your life? Has that been difficult because you always got uprooted and went somewhere new? It's definitely, there were definitely hard times when you're like still wearing MC hammer parachute pants and then you go to the next school and they're not cool anymore. That can be pretty traumatic, but, (laughs) um, that's a steep learning curve. uh, Yeah. But, um, no, I love it. It helps you identify very quickly or become very good at identifying your people. Um, and, you know, who to spend your time on and who not to even bother with. And I yeah, think that's a really interesting point because most kids would never have that experience, right? Because they're staying in the same place. So they might not realize that, oh, this whole dynamic here is replicated at school after school all over the country, <laughs> all over the world. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. And that's what I love about the crypto ecosystem. Or like when I joined Chainalysis like five years ago, nobody was from this space. Nobody had years of experience doing it. And everyone has such a unique, cool background. And it's just such a diverse ecosystem. There's no like pedigree or click. It it was just, it, and it requires so many different disciplines and it requires so many, so much unique expertise from various backgrounds. And that's why I think it's just been so cool, not just people at analysis, but people in the ecosystem in general. I feel like I've just yeah, kind of I been able to totally find. Agree. Yeah, it's a huge reason why I started Decentral with my partner because I just found the people so fascinating after I wrote my book about Ethereum and just took a deep dive into it. And, and everybody I've met back then and, and up until this day, there's just always just incredibly interesting people coming from all different walks of life into this space. And that's, that's something that I just found as a storyteller, that, that you just can't ask for anything more than that. You obviously had a military family, so what, I, I would assume there was a little bit of pressure to go into the military, but was that, you said you're the black sheep, you took a left turn and went into the civilian side of the DOD. Was was that sort of, was that always the plan? Or how, how do you remember thinking about your future when you were in high school or and then getting into college? Yeah, I really didn't. I was very cognizant of the influence of my family. And I, and so I decided not to go to any military academies and go to college with an open mind. And I actually found fairly quickly, I had an influential professor, and this is not too far after um, 9-11, that taught an Islam and politics course. And the Iraq war was very much in public consciousness. And I was so fascinated because I lived all over the world, but I have never lived in the Middle East. And so that, mm-hmm. so starting in college, I locked on to this idea, like, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to understand. And what started as more of, I think, out of wanting to serve and under work in the Middle East for the government actually turned into more of a respect because I took up Arabic, studied Arabic all through college. I lived abroad in the Middle East, but not only did I live there, I lived with families and that just, just changed my whole That's perspective a great way to on it. get a sense of a culture. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For sure. and, and, and again, just, just feeling like I could airdrop in these cultures and just leave was not what happened. These people 
became my families and we're still very much in touch today, but it, it certainly has, has influenced me and, and my, and my, my path. And I think it made me mm-hmm. a better intelligence officer. Yeah. Just as a quick aside, it's fascinating thinking about crypto in the Muslim world because of the Sharia law and uh, prohibition against earning interest and things like that. It's a really interesting, what, what some of the stuff that is coming out of the Middle East there, I find fascinating because there are those extra constraints that they have. I don't think I have a question, but I've just, we've re- reported on that a little bit at the Central and I just find that really, that extra twist makes things like super interesting to me. And I think we've um, actually seen some group some terrorist groups in the Middle East that have actually shut down cryptocurrency fundraising operations because of the traceability of it to from a the terrorist mm-hmm. financing perspective it they've learned that it's again the Achilles heel of illicit activity because it is so traceable yeah. I'd much rather have a bag of cash in the trunk of a car um, <laughs> So just one thing I wanted to, before we get uh, a little further up into your into your resume, uh, one thing that stuck out to me, and so you, you worked for a place called Enigma Technologies Incorporated. You were a commercial manager. That, come on, that's a front, right? That's just, that sounds either <laughs> you were working for the Penguin in like the Batman universe, or that's just like CIA all the way through. It's Enigma Technologies. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, friend, of course, but no, the, that just sounds like too me. good. Oh my gosh, no, you're hitting on something there because my friends joke that I I choose my employer based off of their names, based on like how fun their names are. <laughs> um, yeah, it's real. Analysis is pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, let's get back to like chain analysis and, w- and what you guys are doing now. And just, I know you, we, we spoke about ransomware. I was curious just to touch on we, we mentioned mixers also briefly, and, and for folks who might not know, a mixer is a cryptocurrency kind of utility that you can send like a bunch of Bitcoin into the mixer, and then that Bitcoin gets lumped in with a whole bunch of other Bitcoin and then separated and mixed, and then you get the same amount out, but it's not, it's the in and out has been obfuscated. So that's a nice way to just try to cover your tracks. Um, Tornado Cash was a big one. And I think it was, I believe it was last year that OFAC put it on the sanctions list. It was the first time that a piece of code had been added to the sanctions for no American citizen could interact with it anymore and all sorts of things. I just wondered, is, are you paying attention to that? I would imagine you are. And I, I just was curious about the pros and cons you, of, of what you thought about that decision. And just wanted to just ask you a little bit about that. Yeah, I don't really engage with actors that are leveraging Tornado Cash so much these days. With every, like whether Blender.io, which is a mixer that was take, that was designated, with each one that is either designated or taken offline, there are three others that are <laughs> popping up in their place. So yeah. I, I'm more focused on finding the next one, the new hotness, where am I seeing, where are current threat actors using today? And I think for me, most of the volume is going to the successors that have emerged since those designations. Yeah, like ThorSwap was in the news this week. That's another mixer. They're mm-hmm. trying to, looks like they're trying to get a little more friendly with folks like you guys, like Chainalysis. I, I don't know that for sure, but they made some changes to their front end and and how you can interact with it to make it a little more difficult. And then they're also, I guess, participating in some address screening. So maybe known addresses that are bad actors could get screened out. But do you get into the philosophical side of that where it's, that's a piece of, these mixers are all pieces of code basically. And there are legitimate uses for mixers when privacy is involved or you might want to be donating money to somebody that or but you don't want people to know how much is actually in your wallet or you might live in a country that's sanctioning or it's, there's a lot of different reasons I think legitimate uses for a mixer as well as the illegitimate uses do you, where do you come down on that part of it and, and how that should be where, where is the balance there mm-hmm. no it's it's a super interesting topic and it's one that I I follow more out of personal interest than that has to do with with my my job. I have certainly have friends in the ecosystem, have teammates 
that use mixers, not for anything illicit, but just for privacy. And so there certainly are alternatives available. And each technology is going to continue to evolve. There's going to be new protocols, new services new out there. So I I don't think I don't think innovation is is stifled in that respect. And no, I definitely respect the use and understand the use for legitimate uses as and I but for me, I my job is just tracking those that would use it for laundering dirty money and illicit proceeds. And and certainly they can be used for that. Yeah. And another thing I find really interesting here is you can move crypto around and put it through a mixer or try to cover your tracks as much as you want. But until you can get that crypto out of the ecosystem and and translate it or or have it exchanged for, you know, euros or dollars or rubles or what what may, what what have you, it's like you've only got gains on paper. And that, that seems to me to be like the really hard thing here is that there are still countries like Russia and North Korea to an extent, I think, and some others where there are crypto exchanges that are definitely not playing by the rules and they will do that gladly for you. How much is that a frustration for you? And is that is that the sort of main pain point that you come across? If there was no way to do that, your job would be a lot easier, I would imagine. Mm, yeah, no, that's a good point. And I think, as we said we're talking about earlier, there are a, there's a small number of services in, in some jurisdictions that are not responsive to law enforcement and are not, not enacting robust KYC AML policies at all. And threat actors will follow the path of least resistance. Now, what we saw after designation of some of the the more offending institutions that were laundering everything from DPRK, stolen funds, to ransomware proceeds, to scams, that those that didn't enact robust policies could be designated. And and in many instances, those designations were, were business killers. Deposits dropped to zero. And so these threat actors of all stripes had to find a new way to launder their proceeds, their dirty money. And for some time after those designations uh, on some of those major exchanges and mixers, we actually saw threat actors holding on to their funds in private wallets for a lot longer <laughs> as they tried to figure out what to yeah. do with them. Like what system could they trust? This is yeah, a new mixer. Who owns it? How does mm-hmm. it even work? But I think what the last, I would say, two, three years have shown is that like by following the money, it does shine a spotlight on the offending services that are the go-tos for criminals of all stripes. And that there are tools, there are policy tools at our disposal if if they're not going to to comply with global norms. Yeah. I'd love to ask you a little bit about the Lazarus Group because it seems like they are one of the biggest bad actors here. And that for those who don't know, the, and and I, w- I wanted to ask you if I have this correct. My understanding is that it's it's sponsored by the North Korean state. I, I don't think that the people working for them are ne- necessarily in North Korea, but they are sponsoring hackers and other folks in different parts of the world, like Europe or where wh- whatever. Um, and what they're doing is ransomware. They're hacking bridges, which seem to be a, a very fat target in, in recent past. And they're pulling in hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars for North Korea, which most people think, and I believe uh, this is something that the DOJ has said, that they think that, that a lot of that money is going to help fund the, the nuclear development program for North Korea. Do I have that right about how the rough architecture works of the Lazarus Group, that they're not necessarily, you know, in North Korea, but that they have this network of people around the world that, that work for them? Yeah, my understanding, um, and I'm not following the the st- Inter- integral structure of the group um, as close as many others in our company and many of the partners we work with. Um, but we have seen this kind of multifaceted approach of getting um, access to victims. That's everything from standing up fake recruiting for jobs that um, is, you know, actually infecting the those that would be applying for the job with malware. They're also applying for jobs with 
in companies in the crypto ecosystem or even in the cryptocurrency supply chain. And so when they can't actually develop an exploit for something in the supply chain, they're looking at getting a job on the inside, which is, there's been a lot of public advisories. Would the about. supply chain be like mining operations or what, what do you mean by supply chain on the crypto side? Just a software component or a supplier to different cryptocurrency businesses. So just uh, trying okay. to different ways of breaking into the house. When the window is closed, they'll try the, the basement. They'll try to get a ladder. All the, it's, they're, ingenuity is quite astounding. And we've seen this going from centralized exchanges to DeFi to now even gambling services are on the menu. And so they're really, it's really quite incredible what they've been able to accomplish. I think over like hundreds of millions stolen this year alone. And my goodness, we have to recalculate that pretty regularly because of the the frequency and scale of these attacks. Yeah, it seems every week I read something about Lazarus Group is involved in something. Do you know, does North Korea, is is part of their thing that they also will um, exchange that fiat, uh, that crypto for fiat, like inside the country? Is that something that they're doing or the government is sponsoring that sort of thing? Do you know? There is a great release from law enforcement and treasury I believe a few years ago that talked about the use of China, China-based individuals to launder the proceeds through Chinese banks. They even used gift cards at some point. I, I think it's pretty like when you've been able to read some of the public public documentation about their laundering, it's diversified too. I believe they use the same launderer as hush puppy that like infamous business email compromise scammer based in Nigeria. So again, like all criminals of all stripes using the, the, the Nigerian he's, prince. Yeah, essentially. Yeah. He's got quite a prolific yeah. Instagram account back in the day. Flaunting his riches. Do you, all this talk about money launderers, do you ever, have you run into the mafia, like any of the mafias around the world using crypto to, to launder funds or is that, are they just still old school? That's pretty interesting. I know there were recently designations um, related to fentanyl and the Sinaloa cartel. I think we're focused on a lot of the marketplaces and social platforms where the buying and selling of illicit goods is happening. And certainly there there could potentially be a mafia component there. But from the wallet, from tracing the wallet's perspective, it's really tying it back to, to individuals and monikers that enables law enforcement to tie it to a greater network or organization. Yeah. We're talking about you guys, are, you're going after all these like really scary people and there's hundreds of millions of dollars on the line here. Do you, a chain analysis, do you guys ever get worried about your own safety? Is that, does that come up or how do you guys think about or feel about that sort of aspect of it? Yeah, I think people in our industry are certainly aware of the risks and the dangers. And I have good colleagues across the cyber threat landscape who are dealing with criminals that are financially motivated, but have employed violent tactics in the past. Unfortunately, it's something to be very cognizant of. And there's certainly services on being sold in the underground that have violence as a service. It's so it's something that we look at every day. And unfortunately for them, those services are being sold in cryptocurrency. And that's just another thing that we can trace. Yeah, it's scary. I, when it doesn't even compare, but I was doing some reporting a few years ago on Ripple and XRP and the XRP army, as they're known, they really don't like that. And uh, I got some notifications that my I was being doxxed on the dark web and things like that. And it just makes you really just take a minute to think about how scary that is and how nebulous as well, because you just have no idea what's going on. So just like at the end here, what, where where do you see things headed here? I know you said ransomware has already broken the record, right? And, and it's getting worse. Um, 
what do you, what's next for you? And then like, how do you see the next couple of years in, in terms of what you're doing? Are you winning the fight or how, I know you said compared to five years ago, you're getting way more cooperation and, and the world governments and regulatory agencies seem to be much more on the same page. How would you, how do you think about the next couple of years and where things yeah, are headed? So I think there's a lot of work that is being done and has been done that will continue to bear fruit. The blockchain is immutable. So we're even crimes that happened historically, we can still use those cryptocurrency addresses and identifiers to be able to for cases years down the road. So I think the continued we're we're hopeful for the continued use of that intelligence to support law enforcement efforts, seizure of assets, imposing costs on these different criminals. I think what's top of mind across a lot of the different disciplines that I cover our AI is certainly uh, big and how that will impact crime in all its forms. And we know and are tracking different threat actors that are experimenting with this, claiming to sell different tools that leverage it. I think that the potential for AI in scans is something that I'm very leery of. And scams is, I think they like thankfully getting a lot more attention. I think it's always been our most prolific, our highest grossing crime that we've covered. Um, but it, it certainly doesn't get the sensational headlines of, of some of the other things that we do. Um, but pig butchering is now a, a, a part of our public lexicon. My mom knows what it is. And can, can you give me a quick definition? What is pig butchering? Yeah, it's social engineering, essentially, so that you can interact with these people in multiple ways. Sometimes they'll just cold text you and strike up a conversation. Sometimes it's on dating sites, Facebook, Twitter. It can be on multiple social platforms or even direct to your phone. And they strike up a relationship with you, sometimes romantic, sometimes just friendly and basically catfish people and mm -hmm. continue to have them invest more and more into a crypto scheme, basically fatten up the pig and slaughter it. That's where that thing comes from. It's uh, Chinese yeah. for Shazu Pan. And yeah, it's super devastating, especially because it's agnostic to the price of cryptocurrency. So it, when crypto's booming, we have a lot of newcomers, a lot of investment scams. But these scams are pernicious because we don't see them decline with the price of crypto because when you lure in victims through their heartstring, through friendship, through emotion, they're going to pay way more. And we've actually calculated that victims of pig butchering and romance scams pay magnitudes more than any other type of scam because you're in love with, you think you're in love with this person. You think you're paying for their father's heart surgery. Mm -hmm. It's those goes on and smart people who even people with law enforcement backgrounds or people who are a little bit more, have a bit more stranger danger falling for them because they're getting very good. And that's why I'm extremely concerned about how that's AI, why, yeah, AI could be terrifying there, right? Cause it can learn from itself and <laughs> Jesus, yeah. what have we done? Mm -hmm. Jackie, thank you so much. I love these kind of conversations and thank you for sharing your history and all the fascinating stories and how you got into this for folks who want to know more about chain analysis or yourself, tell people how they can find you and just follow along with what you guys are up to. Yeah, I think so. We are on X, formerly Twitter. I'm also on it. I'm Jay Burden's Coven. We, our blog, the material we release is incredible. We're constantly releasing new reports. Some are exclusives, investigations, macroeconomic statistics. We just released our geographies report talking about the global adoption of cryptocurrency. And right now we're in the full swing of preparing for our end of year crypto crime report, which is always really unique insights. And 
Yeah, we also have some free training courses on videos online as well on our website. So come check us out. Oh, cool. Yeah, I highly recommend it as well. The, the Crime Report especially is always great reading. I've covered it for a couple of years now. And yeah, I just, I'm really impressed with everything you guys are doing. So again, Jackie, thank you so much for coming on and, and uh, sharing your time with us. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you. That's it for this episode. Thanks for joining us. And don't forget to rate and follow this show on Apple, Spotify, and Amazon Music. Decent People is a production of Decentral Media. It is produced by Matt Bogart with music by Brian Duncan and Kareem Imes. 